Um, we're very excited to have the second annual Global Health Economics Colloquium, uh, and particularly pleased that today it is uh, not just a UCSF affair, but uh, co-sponsored by our friends at uh, Stanford and at UC Berkeley. Uh, we've got panels on cost effectiveness, large data sets for cross-national policy analysis, workforce and workplace, um, assessing national policies, behavioral economics. We have a lunch, which we've allowed ample time for networking, and we'll have interest tables. And uh, after lunch, uh, we will review the activities at our three institutions and uh, then move from uh, 3 to 4.30 to parallel workshops on challenges in implementing the Global Health 2035 agenda. We have a really engaging panel this morning, and I wanted to start out with a quick background. When, we, when I was a, a resident in my final year of residency applying for cardiology fellowships, I told my cardiology mentor that I was going to take a year off to go to grad school to study health economics. And she and I had worked together for a couple of years, and she looked me straight in the eye and said, Kazi, get serious now. At some point, you have to get a real job. <laughs> the one good thing that has come out of this, this toxic debate around healthcare reform is that it, both sides of the spectrum at least agree on the fact that costs are a problem here in the United States. Um, in other countries where resources are far more sparse, uh, the recognition that costs, con considering costs is not just important, it's the only way forward, has long been present. Um, Europe and Australia and our northern neighbor have incorporated costs into their regulatory processes or in their purchasing processes, and now increasingly low and middle income countries are interested in understanding what their money is buying when they invest in healthcare. Uh, we've seen an explosion in cost effectiveness papers in the literature, um, and you would think that because there's so much interest, the methods around costing have been figured out already. Uh, what we'll see in today, this morning's panel is that that's not exactly the case. We're still trying to understand the best ways to ca ca capture costs, to measure cost effectiveness. Thanks for, uh, I'm very excited about uh, you know, being here today. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about some uh, work where we try to develop some new um, methods for economic evaluation, particularly disease control priorities project, and which is very relevant also for uh, discussions around universal health coverage. In particular, uh, the um, World Health Report 2000 uh, left us with this uh, you know, uh, famous uh, cube where uh, in its 2010 report, where the idea was to highlight uh, dimensions, three dimensions to consider uh, when one is considering pathways toward universal health coverage. Yet there's been very little discussion about how to move efficiently uh, on the cube in the same way we purchase efficiently health benefits and so on. So we think that part of the, um, part of the issue, or maybe not issue, but part of a, um, uh, the thing that we need to do is to move from what we've been doing traditionally in, in cost effectiveness, which is to very much focus on technical interventions, like, uh, you know, I name here uh, ART for HIV AIDS, you can think of the poly pill, a lot of cost effectiveness analysis is very much around, you know, drug assessments and so on, and to have a more holistic, uh, broader perspective on the health systems. And considering the fact that uh, when you do priority setting, there's a number of ways resources are allocated and also multiple criteria behind uh, or besides uh, burden of disease costs, things like uh, equity and impoverishment. Anyhow, the idea is to focus more at the policy level, some policy instruments, uh, and then to look at basically three kinds of things, uh, the health benefits. I mean, we're, we're doing health, so we might as well you know, keep looking at health gains. That's important. So if in the context of tobacco, that would be the number of premature deaths that are averted due to tax increase because people are quitting smoking. And then the specific focus we'd like to take is to look at household expenditures. So to actually figure it out, like how much people are spending, uh, say in the case of tobacco, uh, how much they're spending to pay for their cancer bills or their heart disease, and how much of that would be basically prevented because they actually uh, quit. And then what we try to do is to quantify, you know, this, scaling them uh, with respect to the uh, income of individuals, to quantify, in other words, how much, you know, people are impacted by their healthcare bills that are out of pocket. 
So one thing I would like to emphasize uh, is that what I think we're interested in is to look at efficient purchase of non-health outcomes, uh, equity, and then interestingly, financial risk protection. So when you think about the cube, and I think in this afternoon we'll talk more about this, is how one can move efficiently on the cube. So I'm buying you know, health gains you know, in a cost-effective manner, but I can buy in a cost-effective manner financial risk protection. So that's one outcome that we're very interested in is to have, you know, how much it costs per poverty case averted, what are these benefits and so on. Um, there are multiple uses for cost data. So when we say costs, it is a word that has lots of definitions. Which costs? What are we talking about? They are different costs. Um, so uh, they're critical for priority setting, evaluating value for money, as we start to think about new interventions, new technologies, introduction of new vaccines, um, new drugs, right? Um, they won't go far if they haven't um, had an economic evaluation to support them. You know, I was just at a meeting last week where um, uh, Kenyan uh, Ministry of Health um, a woman working on the, um, their Kenyan strategic plan for HIV AIDS says, we, we don't even have some costs for interventions that we want to scale up. And yet they have to um, estimate um, their next five-year um, na national strategy. There has been a movement actually in the last few years moving to larger sample um, studies, 30 to 50 facilities per country. These are half million dollar endeavors. Um, and it takes a long time to analyze those data. Um, uh, decision makers are saying, but we need information today. You know, I need to, I, I need a, a country strategic program officer. I mean, working on HIV AIDS says, I need a number now, you know, not in three years. And then WHO, who has provided so much guidance on collecting costs, conducting economic evaluations, very specific cost effectiveness analysis for different conditions, is saying, you know what? We need a sustainable system to um, support our efforts. You know, we can't keep reinventing the wheel year after year. And so, in fact, uh, there are recent and a new movement to try to start routinizing um, cost data collection. So why does it matter? And I think Kazi got to this. On many levels it matters. You know, one, if we're, if we're using published literature in our economic evaluations, we want to know that we can trust that these are reliable estimates that are going into our model studies. But countries and donors, don't know, they don't trust the data. They don't have the data. They don't know if they're using the correct data. Um, and if that's the case, then maybe they're overestimating the costs in their, um, their budgets and their applications to Gavi or to um, the Global Fund. Um, if they're using $400 per AR, uh, for ART per person rather than $200, that's a waste of resources. Worldwide, about 170 million people are affected with chronic hepatitis C, a number which exceeds the current prevalence of HIV, although it is less lethal than HIV. Here's the good news, it's curable. And it's particularly curable now with the introduction and approval by the FDA of new combination therapies, um, particularly those therapies that do not require inter interferon uh, or ribavirin, which is the standard uh, care, has been the standard of care. There's only one major problem. These treatments are expensive, and they are very expensive. So on the one hand, you have high effectiveness. On the other hand, you have high costs. Sounds like nectar to a B for somebody who's interested in cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, we found that um, Sabasavir uh, uh, had a cost effectiveness ratio of about $20,000. Um, so in comparison with traditional therapy, and that is for a, uh, a treat-all scenario. If you delay treatment, the cost-effectiveness ratio becomes even more favorable at about $16,000 uh, per dally. Uh, this is highly cost-effective by any criteria. Um, and if you consider the cost-effectiveness of liver transplant, which is averted by successful therapy, we are way in the highly cost-effectiveness, high, highly cost-effective realm. Uh, the, the new treatments are highly cost-effective. Treating early is also cost-effective. Results are sensitive to drug prices, no surprise there. And with large reductions in uh, the cost of drugs, we can think about um, having a global 
program to actually eliminate hepatitis C. Access is very important. By no means do I want to uh, convey the idea that cost effectiveness is the only thing that needs to be taken into account in formulating policy. And if hepatitis C is to be eliminated as a global priority, clearly the issue of price needs to be addressed. We have reason to believe, as I mentioned before, that this is now in the works. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a few methods uh, that are new-ish in the sense that they've been introduced and increasingly popular over the last two to three years. Um, and I also say ish in the sense that they're not entirely new in the sense of providing a tremendously new way of thinking about observational data. That is, they're intended to do what all observational methods sort of fundamentally try to do, which is overcome our limitation of either practically or ethically or financially not being able to do a randomized trial for some of the most interesting policy questions, or at least what I find interesting. Here's an example from the United States of analysis relating, for instance, food stamps to increased obesity after controlling for income. Perhaps that is indeed the case. Food stamps are causing obesity. Alternatively, perhaps there are other unmeasured factors omitted from this regression. Uh, supermarkets in the area, your childhood history that may push you towards being in situations that lead you to food stamps and also to lead you to be obese that weren't captured. The idea is to match people as closely possible on their observable characteristics, like propensity score or other matching, and then make them near on those characteristics because very far apart on the instrumental variable. I'm a 32-year-old Indian man. You find another 32-year-old Indian man in another state and we are very far apart in terms of whether or not our food stamp program has efficient enrollment. Near on observed, far on our instrument. The idea is that it actually makes weak instruments quite a bit stronger and gives one more power in the inference. And I chose these examples in part because one actually finds reversal of the effect direction when implementing some of these measures. Um, we did it for the India program and a colleague did it in the context of the U.S. food stamp program. The example of this method, synthetic control, the intuition is one looks at the underlying factors driving the outcome. For example, in this uh, case of diarrhea, there's a number of variables, coliform bacterial content in wells and so forth, that one knows as predictors of the outcome. You then weight your possible available control groups. So if you're comparing uh, intervention in California, look at Utah, Arizona, weight the populations that have similar predictors of the outcome. If your outcome is tobacco smoking, for instance, look at the number of adolescents, the tax rates, and so forth. And you create a synthetic California to compare against your intervention. You then do a so-called placebo analysis where you do that for each other possible control group and then look at whether your intervention state is sufficiently different from the, from the others questions, uh, sort of uh, some intuitive questions about what's ha what is happening to, uh, to the distribution of, of child mortality within countries. So the overall child mortality in low income countries has been declining, but that can be consistent either with a convergent picture between the uh, wealthier and poor or with a uh, divergence. Um, so, um, so um, if uh, one looks at uh, the, the, the big uh, data sets such as the global burden of disease, um, you, you can't really tell what is happening to uh, child mortality um, uh, based on, on wealth, okay? And we're going to measure the, whether things of, uh, whether mortality has been converging or diverging within countries, okay? Um, um, I'm going to look at two different measures of, of, uh, of convergence or, or divergence, I suppose. Um, you can look at that. So, for example, uh, uh, one can imagine that, um, uh, so the, the one is going to be the absolute difference between the rich and poor, and the other one is going to be the ratio between the poor and rich. And when you look at the, uh, when you look at the sort of the, the best fit curves of what is going on with mortality, you can see uh, that things are really um, converging. Um, and they're converging whether you're looking at the difference in mortality and they're converging uh, whether you're looking at the ratio of mortality and they're converging in almost all countries. Really what is happening is that, is that under five mortality among the poorest has declined the most sort of quite rapidly. In fact, um, uh, really there is a very, uh, hardly anywhere where under mortality is above or under five mortality is above 200, even among the poorest. We're really uh, watching the sort of the, the, the tail of the epidemiologic transition where, um, um, uh, where you have uh, sort of very high mortality uh, uh, among children. 
and that's uh, slowly disappearing. Um, and the other thing that's sort of interesting to note is that, uh, is that there is no clear evidence of conversions until about 2000, and then, and then, uh, and then really after that there's sort of evidence of, of, uh, of uh, uh, really uh, accelerating divergence. Uh, I'm looking at some of the, the data set that you analyzed, and just could you comment on how reliable these things are and whether cross-national or over time differences make any of this stuff yeah. impossible to analyze? Yeah, so, so it, it, it's a good question. It, you know, one, one, one uh, uh, aspect that's, uh, so, so a few things about DHS. One is, you know, it's, it's the same questionnaire, it's the same, the same core survey has been around and been uh, implemented since the early 1980s, the very same, same question, same, you know, if, if it's not in English, they translate back, translate. Um, the, 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 in terms of, of the quality of the survey, it's, it's really pretty high quality. They provide all the, the, uh, the you know, the sort of the, the survey sampling errors and whatnot. Um, th there is a question about the quality of, um, well, so, you, you know, there's a question about the, whether, for example, countries where, um, again, roads are better, um, it's easier to sort of get to remote villages, um, uh, uh, surveyors are potentially paid more, maybe they have uh, uh, no PDAs and whatnot, whether the quality of the, the, the data generating process changes by country and changes over time. And, uh, you know, the answer is, is, is probably yes. Now, there also, there, there are some, there are lots of, uh, of, uh, of data um, in, the, in the DHS that's uh, it's about, you know, hemoglobin tests. And so things like that are, you know, a little bit more, um, uh, you, you can sort of have some, some faith in those a little bit more over time. So, uh, so Dean, uh, these are the three themes out there. And Dean's Lancet report with others, Larry Summers and other colleagues here, uh, panel chair, uh, talks about the grand convergence. And this is an important element. I put it there because there, there's lots of things. But one of the things that the grand convergence means is to try to have one child survival. It's about kids in low and middle income countries equal those found in middle and upper income countries. Remember that because the workforce model I'm about to show you keys on that variable. The other major theme around the globe is uh, universal health coverage. Everybody's now into trying to come up with their version of Obamacare. Hopefully a better job than that, but uh, in China, India, all around the world. To, get, to have people covered for insurance and be able to access care. And of course, I feel that one and two won't happen without three. And three is having enough healthcare workers. A lot of numbers, Jim was correct to suggest that I focus on some. So for the world, the forecast by 2030 on demand is 7.3 million healthcare workers. The need-based analysis using the ILO, which is the number of healthcare workers you need for universal coverage is 5 million. Uh, yeah. And then uh, WHO criteria. So these are different need-based numbers, right? But the demand is high. But the real takeaway that's interesting from this, if you take one country out of this macro model of the world, Demand for healthcare workers, China. The demand for healthcare workers that you need goes from 7 million to less than a million. So the storyline is the economic demand for healthcare workers is essentially coming from China in the next 20 years. We have known for decades and decades and decades how to very effectively treat depression and anxiety, and we can do it through many different ways and in very low cost ways. Um, and yet, the burden of mental disorders continues to increase. Depression accounts for 40% of the DALIs attributable to mental disorders from the 2010 study, and about 15% comes from anxiety. The rest is alcohol, drugs, and schizophrenia. So the bottom line here, if you're thinking like a company, is that depressed employees are less productive and they're more expensive in terms of healthcare costs. So the next obvious question, if you're thinking like a company, is, well, what do we do about this? If we increase the mental health coverage, does that yield a net positive return? That is, if we are able to treat and reverse the depression, does the gain that we get as a result of doing that in productivity 
and reduction in health care costs offset the amount that we pay for mental health treatment. This has been done only in the U.S., these analyses, and only in a kind of a corporation model. This is a you know, cost-benefit analysis, so not, not enough of these done yet. But to date, the two RCTs that have been done have shown uh, net positive returns. So I'm going to put into 20 years of work within 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, now, so this is the seriousness of the smoking. This is the March issue of an Economist. They, they dedicated one special issue on the problem of smoking in China. You can see the smoking kills 100 million people in China. Actually, it's 1.2 million right now. So the question is, we have a 1.3 billion population, 300 million smokers. We have a secondhand smoker, 740 million. So in other words, 1.2 uh, billion people of about the, essentially in the, exposed by the smoking uh, exposure there. What we did is based on the econometric model and look at assumptions to see that using the mail with the mail uh, the data. With the data we have a smoking prevalence rate of about 52 percent, 2010. So if nothing happened, of course that the, the there is a downward trend of smoking. Maybe by 2020 it will be 50.4. But if we're going to uh, raise the tax in China, raise the tax to 75 percent, we will see that the smoking permits will be reduced to 45 percent, which means the change will be reduced by 5.3 percent. So we have done the econometric modeling to show that if we just use the, the current data, uh, the uh, raise one uh, uh, renminbi, uh, which is about 15 cents per pack. Uh, the raised tax would be increased from 45% to 51%. And government revenue would be increased by 85.4 billion. We obviously, our audience is the government, so we have to make sure that the, the leaders of governments know that it's going to be win-win policy. And our very modest proposal, which was that if we raise one renminbi per pack, and we also want to simplify the tax system instead of a two-tier, three-tier, we want to use the highest, the current level, 56%. And we also raise 5% at the uh, uh, whole sales price, uh, uh, the, the tax rate. We estimate about the 60%. If we do all that, the tax rate will be increased from 45 to 60%, which will be essentially about saving $2 million, uh, 2 million people down the road. The good news was that three weeks ago I was in China, and uh, I say now is a good time, prime time, because we hear the leaders in China, President Xi Jinping, that uh, already said he understands that smoking is not good for the population of health in China. So our policy has been requested right, right, by the, his office, in the president's policy office, two weeks ago. And uh, so and we also talked to the Ministry of Finance and we, from other sources there, this is one of the proposals among the five they are considering. So let's hope next year, 2015, will be the year of raising tax in cigarette in China. So uh, I was interested in this question um, because it was a large scale campaign um, and it was um, early enough uh, in terms of there had been enough time elapsed, it occurred in 1985, <laughs> that allowed us to look at things not only on the health dimension, but also in terms of human capital, and by that I mean um, literacy and educational and, uh, ed attainment. And these, and these um, findings that you get out of this more uh, torturous econometrics actually just reinforce the graphical intuition in that um, you don't see large and you know any significant decline really in infant mortality or child mortality. That's including if you do quantile regression, um, but you do see gains in literacy. So if your VPD, your vaccine preventable illness prevalence was higher by 5 per thousand, that impl and it's implied um, a 10 percent increase in percentage point increase in literacy, and the declines in disability um, are about one percentage point decline. But what I said and what I really like about this paper is that we can start looking at um, what are the effects on children that weren't immediately. 
for example, the siblings. And so what I have here is three columns, first the full sample, older siblings, then the girls, and then the boy siblings. And what we see is if you go to, a, um, if you went from a family where there were zero children who are age eligible for the vaccine, where um, the entire sibling set was el age eligible for the vaccine, you'd see an increase in um, it for the same uh, prevalence at baseline in the community, you'd see an increase of in literacy about 2.7 percentage points among the full um, sample of siblings. It, it seems to me that what underlies a lot of the talks from smoking to, to uh, uh, lots of other things, adherence to drugs, is, is behavior change. And uh, I'm going to tell you briefly that uh, uh, something you all know, behavior change is hard, and I'm going to tell you uh, about some attempts that failed. It's not too surprising that I can't get the, the women in, in Kenya or, or Bangladesh to treat their water wash hands because we can't get doctors to do it if we, if we just tell them about germs. So I wanted to take advantage of this result I said, which is if people know someone's watching in the U.S. or Britain, they wash hands a lot more. So it seems that, that you can have a norm that says don't be seen uh, eating shit or something and that that might be more effective than saying they're germs and this will reduce the prevalence of diarrhea disease from five times a month to three and a half times, you know. Maybe we can just say it's disgusting to walk around with poop on your hands and don't let your neighbors see it. So we, we um, ran a randomized trial. We had two messages of uh, our very best germs and health message and our very best um, disgust and shame uh, shit message. Um, I love, it's the high point of my new phase of my career is I get to talk filth. Um, they, for some reason, they never let me be the lunch speaker. I, I don't know why not. <laughs> Across our study arms, um, we did not get increased use of the chlorine or um, some people boil, and uh, we didn't see more safe water um, in, in any sustained way. We, we just did sort of one and a half presentations. We got women. We didn't get hardly any men. We didn't get all the women. We didn't have a lot of reminders and stuff. Um, it's not a community that, that had as strong of care of what their neighbors thought as I hoped. So um, uh, we've decided to double down. If, if you fail, instead of backing off, we're going we're gonna to go to places where there is more repeat interaction, which is schools. And um, we're going to go there again and again, because we're going to have a bunch of stories and games. And uh, we don't get to use the word shit anymore in schools. Um, but we, we are going to get as vivid as we can. We have stories. and and games, and, and the idea is, is pretty simple, that stories and games are about conflict, and so you should be able to make a, a story or game that's somewhat in, engaging. The study I will be talking about has to do with medical male circumcision, and there the behavioral issue is very simple, and um, as you'll see in the study, it's actually very, uh, allowed us to complete the study in one year. It's, it's just an issue of uptake. Going and getting circumcised um, is a behavioral, uh, it's obviously a choice that men have to make, and uh, that, that, without that uh, high levels of uptake, we're not going to see the benefits of male circumcision be realized at scale. Uh, essentially, what we did is provide compensation to men who chose to come and get circumcised. I'll tell you about the details of that intervention on the next slide. But the rationale, there's, there's a two-pronged rationale, and I want to be, um, be clear about this, uh, particularly since it's t it, the, the talk is within a behavioral economics session. Um, the standard rationale is just that if men are reporting um, high opportunity costs uh, uh, and, and, and that is the barrier to getting circumcised, then providing some compensation can offset those real costs. So that's a standard Econ 101 rationale. Then the behavioral economics rationale might have to do with the fact that uh, if you think about male circumcision, the costs of getting circumcised are very immediate, right? So the, 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 the fact that pe men have to overcome the fear of pain or adverse ev events, or the men have to be willing to um, uh, be, be part to, to, ex to have that sexual abstinence period, the benefits often might be much delayed. And so in the behavioral economics rationale, providing compensation or an incentive can provide some immediate benefits that may offset those immediate costs. In the control harm, we had very low uptake. 1.6% of, of participants came for circumcision. Um, similar in the $2.50 arm, where we see higher, uh, significantly higher uptake is in the uh, arm where men were offered 700 shillings. Um, and then in the 1,200 shilling arm, we saw uptake of 9%. And that's, uh, uh, as a reminder, that's within a two-month period after the, the, the enrollment and randomization. So the bottom line is uh, the, the, the small amounts of compensation 
We're very effective in promoting uptake uh, within a two-month period, uh, certainly compared to the control and, the, and the, the smaller compensation amount. If you think about it from the standpoint of cost effectiveness, we have uh, modeling results that, su that suggest five to 10, every five to 15 circumcisions can prevent one HIV infection. So if you're, th you're talking about spending an additional $12 to compensate men or an additional $15, um, the, given the amount of, the number of circumcisions we would generate, that's, um, that's certainly uh, highly cost effective. So I'm going to uh, start our presentation off. This is a review of behavioral economic tools that could have an impact on the grand convergence um, uh, that is uh, discussed in Lancet, uh, in the Lancet series Global Health 2030. Uh, there is proposed a grand convergence of maternal child and infectious disease in low-income countries to the best performing middle-income country levels. This requires increased health intervention utilization and quality the question we uh, are trying to look at here is can behavioral economics help? And to try to get at that, we uh, started, we are doing a systematic review, which we are presenting the initial results of here. Ali. If you want to point. Sure. Thank you, Jim, for the clear, brief uh, background. Uh, my name is Ali Mirzazadeh, and I came to UCSF uh, in 2012. So the take-home message is that uh, the behavioral economic works uh, may work more multiple disease. This is an intervention package that could be, should be considered to reach the millennium goals and also the grant coverage. However, the effect size is very a lot, uh, and uh, the, wide, the, most, the maximum effect was about 60% in vaccination, we observed that. So let me just tell you a little bit about what's going on at Stanford. Um, we have a fair amount of economics in general and some health economics, and I'm just going to give you a very brief overview. So I'll tell you first, the centers that, that I'm in, uh, two, the Center for Health Policy and the Center for Primary Care and Outcomes Research, and our mission is to help imp is to improve health uh, through interdisciplinary quantitative research on health policy. Very similar idea to the mission statement that Jim just showed you. Our research agenda includes comparative effectiveness, cost effectiveness, um, national and international policy research, patient safety, et cetera. We are hoping and aiming to address important national and international clinical policy and health policy questions and to try to be at the forefront of innovation and methods. Our main areas of focus are health economic, decision sciences, development economics, and health law now. We have recently, over the past two years, recruited two of the very best uh, health law scholars in the world uh, to Stanford. And so that's a new area for us that we're incredibly excited about. Uh, and some of it uh, does have to do with international health. A lot of it's domestic. Um, and so those really are the, the main areas. And again, I just want to give my thanks to Jim and everyone up here and tell you how delighted we are to be a part of this. We wrote a mission uh, that PECON promotes the use of state-of-the-art economic analyses to increase the impact of public health and clinical science to advance the health of people worldwide. And in that mission, uh, identify the notion of precision health policy, that is the use of evidence to, afford, to inform a locally adapted health strategies and interventions in order to achieve large and lasting health gains. And this uh, uh, consortium includes issue, uh, efforts in, in technical research, collaborations, and innovative teaching and training. And, up until now, officially speaking, Geekon is just UCSF with many supportive friends outside. Uh, Doug actually is the chair of our external advisory board. And uh, with this meeting, uh, we, uh, are, which we're co-hosting, as, as you all know, we hope that's the beginning of extending Geekon to being a, a multi-institutional enterprise. <clears throat> I will end with our first... Uh, uh, a big success out of Geekon, uh, but uh, also involving our partners around the Bay Area. Um, we applied to the CDC for a cooperative agreement uh, uh, to assess the economics of prevention for multiple diseases and created a consortium called CAPE uh, to assess prevention economics. Uh, this was a project that I think, fair to say, might not have happened without Geekon. We were able to move uh, quickly, and we'd have many of our connections in place. 
uh, we'll be looking at HIV, hepatitis, STIs, and TB for the United States. The people involved are at UCSF, uh, Stanford, UC Berkeley, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and uh, PATH. Well, we have a very large and distinguished economics department. Uh, half of the Nobel Prizes the last 10 years have come out of that department. So it's pretty high level, and people do dabble, but they're not totally in the field. But there is some really high-level, classy work going on there. Uh, the other thing that I'm uh, very excited about and uh, is uh, I agreed after a lot of years of badgering by this uh, uh, publisher, World Scientific, to do what's called a handbook. Handbooks are a new name for what we used to call encyclopedias. So I'm doing, uh, agreed to edit a three-volume handbook on global health economics, all you wanted to know about it. So we have a bunch of centers, and this is probably a partial list, but basically uh, there's a population center that Will has that does global health. There's a Center for Effective Global Action. Uh, this is um, part of the Blum Center. There's a Center for Global Public Health, uh, which is in our school. There's a Center for Economics and Demography of Aging. And then there's my own Center for Global, Global Center for Health Economics and Policy. So this is a partial list of centers, all who do some, but almost all of their work in the uh, global health area, but at least a good chunk of them. So when you add these people up, if you can, that it's, it's you know, it's a formidable group. <laughs>